Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 10th, 2015, and this is the week in charts. There's a disclaimer screen, and I can sum it up pretty quickly. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. So, this week I want to talk about. And let me make sure we got the right thing up here. This week I want to talk about the question, uh, continuing in my last week's presentation, like is this a top or not? And there's a few select things I want to point out to you this week. First of all, and this is straight from my stock selection course, when a market is, uh, my pen's not working here. Talk among yourselves. When a market is trending ideally you want to see it thrust pull back thrust pull back and you want to see it work its way higher there it is in a stair step sort of fashion so in other words it's kind of this a b a b rinse and repeat up correction up correction up correction and then obviously we use this propensity of markets to correct and then resume their uptrend to our advantage you don't want to see a market take off from a pullback and then pull back in to its prior pullback like this. And obviously if it's doesn't even get past the prior pullback, then it's going to start looking like a double top. For instance, it'll look more like this up here and then here. The other thing you got to watch out for is overhead supply. Now, as I preach quite often, there's nothing magical about my form of technical analysis. I'm just simply using the charts to read the psychology of the market. Now, we could talk quite a bit about overhead supply, and I did, obviously, in the stock course, but let me just sum up a few things for you. First of all, it's just where a lot of people have likely bought a market. Usually, traders don't agree for long, but it, it, the longer they agree, the longer the A is, the more significant the overhead supply is. Also, the further back in time the overhead supply is the less important it is the closer it is the more important it is so the length plus how far back is very important and obviously how far a market drops below it and then how far above it conversely how far above it how far the overhead supply is above the market so if you go to take a trade and you know b is quite a long time and then the markets drop significantly meaning that you have a lot of rub between from where your potential trade is up to the overhead supply and if you make it from here all the way to here this is a hundred percent then so what if you make a hundred percent of a trade that's pretty good trade it's better than the poke of the eye obviously but when it's a little bit closer then you have to be concerned because those traders might look to get out of break even now once it does begin to drop significantly below the overhead supply, those who bought during that range begin to kind of wake up a little bit. And if it drops and then goes right back up, kind of like a V-shaped recovery or like a V-move like this, then people tend to either, either breathe a sigh of relief and don't bother getting out or they don't even notice it to begin with. But the more pain that is caused as a market trades below this overhead supply, the more likely the traders will be looking to get out at break even. And the third thing that I think is relative to this market that you need to pay attention to is the net net change. So net net change, one of the simplest things ever, probably the simplest form of technical analysis, technical analysis 101 is, is the price higher, lower, and never forget, unchanged from where it was. Prices could do three things, and only three things. They could be higher, be lower, or they could be unchanged. So when you find yourself trying to figure out if it's a third of a fifth or a fifth of a third, and you're counting uh, the waves, or if you're on a 13th bar of a count that resets, if this bar is lower than this bar, and this bar is past this bar, or whatever, then take a step back and say, well, is the market higher, lower, or about the same as it was a week ago, a month ago, 
a year ago. And it's very important. So let's let's kind of break down these things. It's one thing to look at some figures. It's another thing to look at actual markets. First of all, we obviously, way back in November, we were right around here, the S&P 500. And then notice that throughout 2015, not a whole lot happened. We ended up right around here. So the market just kind of vacillated back and forth for months and months and months. So we had a pretty serious, obviously, sat downtrend. Now we've broken down in here. And net-net from this peak to this trough is a 12% plus. So it's a pretty serious drop. And the thing is, it's over a fairly short period of time. In fact, most of it unfolded over, what, several days here. So if you look at where we were last November and you look at where we are now, obviously the market has lost quite a bit of steam. Uh, not only, I'm sorry, not only has it lost steam, it's actually net-net much lower than it was months ago. So that is obviously, obviously scores that are negative. And if you look again where it was more recently to where we are now, uh, I'm just kind of eyeballing it, but I think that's about a 10% drop, maybe a little bit less. But that's still a pretty serious drop on a net-net basis, ignoring all the little price bars in between. So net-net, the market doesn't look great. Now, obviously, we go on, if we go on to make new highs, then things become a little bit more different. Then maybe we're okay. And keep in mind, I'm not a big prognosticator. I just kind of follow along what's going on. And that's how I earned, you know, the name. If you, if you don't, it's trend following moron because I just, I just look at the charts and try to peel away all the fluff. And in doing so, let's take a look at this overhead supply. Notice that this market for months and months and months and months have just traded in a range. Now, keep in mind that traders don't agree for long. By the way, I don't want to digress too far. But throughout my public career, anytime the market does this for a significant amount of time, I get a lot of emails from people touting the spread trading and the selling of spreads and the mean reversion trading and blah, blah, blah. And, oh, I wrote this system and look how great it is. Well, you have to realize sometimes what you're seeing is just an aberration. Oh, but Dave, you could say that for trend following too. Yeah, you can, but we tend to only trade when there is trend or at least what we think is an emerging trend. And then the other time we sit on our hands. I don't want to digress too far, but no matter how many dead money reports I put out, or um, I guess it's kind of like a similar thing. No matter how many reports I put out by saying, just sit on your hands, let's rewind that. No matter how many reports I put out or, or just sit on your hands or how many columns where the market's chopping and going sideways, I still get emails after emails after emails. Like, can't we do this or can't we do that? Well, you can do whatever you want, but it's taken me many years to realize that you're better off just doing one thing, kind of like Curly and City Slickers when he was asked the secret of life or the meaning of life, whatever. It's like one thing, and it's like just do one thing, but do it well. And for me, it's trend following on a short to intermediate term basis. And when the market starts chopping sideways, I just don't do anything. And those of you on a trading service know that we established a bunch of positions early, uh, late last year, early this year. And then we really didn't do a whole lot of uh, trading, not a significant amount of trading, as long as this market was in this range. I think we had one short, and we might have had a log or two here or there, but not a whole lot, especially in more recent times when there were fewer and fewer opportunities, okay? Um, so I'm getting distracted by a, a question. <laughs> Ooh, I thought it was the... F moron. Oh, yeah, I've been called that, too. I've been called a lot. So, anyway, traders usually don't agree for long and never get caught into permanent market hypothesis because markets are always changing. And be careful that what you're seeing is not an aberration. Now, before I digress too far, again, when we're talking about overhead supply, so likely a lot of people have bought during this range. Now, somebody asked a very good question last week and said, 
well, hey, Dave, how do you know they don't they have it all sold? Well, you don't. But the fact that this unfolded so fast over, let's just say, three days, and for all intents and purposes, really two days, because the first slide just was to get you to the bottom of the range, I doubt seriously that everybody sold out at least that fast. And then my other analogy was, okay, well, let's say a bunch of retail sold, but what about these funds? And turning a fund or, or selling stocks in a fund is kind of like turning a battleship. They can't just dump all their stock on the market at one time otherwise they will become the market they'll kind of become a, a self-fulfilling prophecy as far as like the market sell-off is concerned if that's a correct way of putting that so they're going to have to scale out of their positions and what they might be doing is using these rallies as a gift to get out of them and then the other thing i said i don't want to digress too far on this i guess it's too late but like last week i said let's say you're you're a fund and you're long apple and, you know, you do the window dressing and everybody says, oh, Apple looks great. Do you have Apple in your portfolio? Why, yes, I do. Here's my Apple. See that I have Apple? And then, but if Apple becomes a turd, then it's going to be like, please tell me you don't have Apple in your portfolio. So that so-called window dressing, it's going to kind of like a window undressing, if that makes any sense or whatever. They're going to have to take the Apple out of, uh, out of the cart, out of the, out of the window. And it takes time to do those type of things. They can't just dump all that stock on the market at one time. Now, some people have gotten excited about this little rally in here, and that's good. That that makes me feel like, okay, well, at least um, I'm seeing all these signs. And what scares me is it's, it's, it's almost too obvious, okay? So the fact that some people are seeing it as a buying opportunity tells me that human nature never changes and that – technical analysis still works. Now, I hope they're right, and I hope the market just goes straight back up because I'd much rather play the long side than the short. But as I preach, you have to play the hand that's dealt. Okay. Now, I digress quite a bit, but the point I'm trying to make is a lot of trading overhead, okay? So even if the market does begin to rally, and again, I hope it does, I got to be careful. You know, I've learned I've learned to rephrase the way I say things, especially around friends and family, because they don't see me. They don't care when I'm bullish. That doesn't seem to get them excited or anything. But the second I turn bearish, they all get pissed off at me. So I've learned instead of instead of vocalizing my position passionately. What I do now is I say I couch by well, I don't really couch, but I just say it doesn't look good. I hope it keeps going up, but it doesn't look good right now. So that way they can't they can't give me a hard time. Are oh, you always a bear? You know, I'm not always a bear. It's like if you've been around me for most of uh, since 2009, you think I'm always a bull. If you've been around me in 2008, yeah, I'm always a bear. OK, late 99, I'm always a bull. So it is what it is. I think the market's going to have a lot of trouble in here. Um, you know, I really hated the fact that we we dropped below this range. Now, what could happen sometimes, and I think it's too late now, but sometimes you get a range like this. So let's say you get this knockout bar out of the range. Sometimes the market could go right back up. This is enough to suck in some short scare a few logs, and then the market takes off from there. But I think the damage has been done in two ways. One, the length that it drops below and two now we're getting some time below so the more these two things work length meaning time and distance here so let's say time and distance that's probably a better way of, of putting it so it's not confusing so the more time the more distance you spend underneath the overhead supply the more important the overhead supply becomes it's also known as overhead resistance now I alluded to the fact that you could have like a knockout move below a uh, base and then take off right back above it. And that actually will test out. But I think now we have a little bit more than that. So that kind of dovetails in to what's going on from the, the TKO perspective, trend knockout. Now, I've showed this chart or a similar chart recently, and I just updated it today. We had back in 2013, as you can see, a pretty nice little trend. In fact, from a linear regression standpoint, or as I like to do, just draw lines through the bars, 
it was a pretty serious trend. We could connect almost all these bars. And the ones that aren't connected, you have daylight above the trend line. So this is positive development here, or was a positive development. Uh, net net from here to here was a pretty good run. Okay, It was a very persistent run, meaning that the market tended to go up day after day after day. In this particular case, it's month after month after month. This is a monthly chart, by the way. And it does help to look at weekly and monthly charts to give yourself a little perspective. This is a monthly. And we had this TKO here. Okay, Now, it was pretty painful at the time because, remember, this is a monthly chart. Much easier, easier to look at a monthly chart and think nothing really happened. But in reality, we had some minor sell signals here. We got short, and then the market started going back up a little bit. But a little bit is the key word in that sentence. It really didn't materialize into anything. In fact, let's say this would be your entry above the TKO. Notice that it really didn't go anywhere for a long, long time. And now we've got this move lower, which is not too far from the prior move lower. So getting back to figure one, I think, or one of the first figures I talked about, it's like when this pullback pulls back into the prior pullback, that's concerning. So you see here, over here on the left side, the pullbacks are above the prior pullbacks, okay, in that stair-step fashion, fashion, as opposed to it coming back down below or back to, I should say, the prior pullback. And that's kind of what we have on a TKO type of basis. Now, it does have a little bit of a double top knockout look to it, in case you were noticing that. But the thing is, you've got too much space in between your knockout bars for that to really be a, like a double top knockout. If it were just a few months in here and you had another knockout, then that's okay. That's what I call a DTKO. And as long as you've got a strong, strong trend and just a few bars sideways, maybe a knockout, or no knockout, I'm sorry, a few bars sideways and then a knockout. But here you've got a knockout and then another knockout at the flat level, and then you've got a big, wide area between them, okay? So, again, a double top knockout is when you have, like, a little flat top and then a knockout. This is more than a little flat top. And then, again, this knockout brings you all the way back to this correction, okay? I think I kind of beat the dead horse on that. So let's talk about the bow ties. Now, this is a weekly bow tie, okay? And you can see that the moving averages, this is a 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. Let your charting package do it for you. Don't get all excited about the math. It's in pretty much any charting package in the world, including some free ones out there on the Internet. You can play with them. And it's when these moving averages come together and cross over over a quick period of time, a short period of time. You can see it kind of looks like a bow tie when they do that. And, again, this is a weekly chart. It kind of helps you gain a little perspective when you look at these longer-term charts. And you look for a pullback afterwards. So we now have that weekly signal. If you watch my recent little chart, two-minute uh, YouTube did a couple weeks ago, I said that we had a, a signal that was in um, – imminent and then now we are uh now we have the official signal now keep in mind you have the signal the setup and the trigger as we talked about a few weeks back by the way there's a lot of good stuff if i say so myself on this top talk I'm going back a week or two so go in and see watch those archives as time allows And they're all here, right? They're all right here on YouTube. So anyway, we got the bow tie down, and then uh, we'll talk about the significance of that in just one second. Now, the other thing, or one other thing, to take a look at is the fact that we do have this daylight. And daylight is simply the lows are greater than the moving average. You could pick whatever moving average you want. Uh, I like to show like a 200-day moving average just because it's well-watched. And you can see we had daylight 2013, 2013, 2013. We had this little sell-off, but that was kind of like a V-shaped, just little blip in the charts. And then we had daylight again. So we only had a few days below the moving average on a daylight basis. But now, this is a daily chart, by the way, and this is a 200-day moving average. 
But now we have a significant amount of daylight below that moving average. So that becomes somewhat concerning. Now, I might be getting a little far further ahead of myself than I want to, but I think now is a good time to mention it. Everything works better with trend. So if a trend does develop, then the simplest of the most simplest methods will work quite well. And it doesn't mean that they test out. And you know, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So keep in mind that if a trend does develop, then yes, this signal was very important. If the trend doesn't develop, then the signal was, it didn't work, okay? Not everything works all the time. And we'll come back to that in one second. And of course, the dun, 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 death cross that the media gets all excited about. And that's simply when a 50-day moving average crosses below the 200-day moving average, as you have recently seen here in the S&P 500. Now, here's the thing. It, and, and when I say it, it means buying and selling on moving average crossovers. Does it test out? In fact, Rob Hanna, and you always get something good out of Rob Hanna. He's a good friend of mine. We've been um, buddies ever since the trading markets days, way back when the earth was cooling. And, uh, you know, you look at these guys that have been around for the last 15, 20 years. It's like markets tend to weed out the um, bull stuff, you know. <laughs> so, Anyway, but uh, he actually published research that shows that it doesn't necessarily test out, meaning that if you sold every time there's a golden cross, I'm uh, sorry, a death cross, and you bought every time there was a golden cross, meaning that uh, the 50-day moving average came back above the 200-day moving average, you wouldn't you wouldn't make money by just trading that system in and of itself. But there's a little bit of a piece that's missing, and like I said earlier. Everything works better with trend. So the piece that's missing is the peak to trough when a trend does ensue can be quite significant and it should not be ignored. So when you get any of these signals, a bow tie, uh, a turn down in a moving average, a crossing of a moving average, daylight, pick your favorite signal or even net net move. You should pay attention in case a trend begins to ensue and you certainly don't want to to fight the market when you have a developing situation like this so my point was that yeah you're not going to always make money selling a death cross or a bow tie or a daylight or whatever you want to call it but let's just focus on a death cross because that's what everybody gets excited about you're not always going to make a lot of money if you sell and then buy okay when it crosses back up they call this a golden cross but like I said last week, these peak to troughs can be very significant in between. So you could have a pretty serious move down, and then you could have a pretty serious move back up, and then the moving averages cross back over. You could have a lot of lag in this, that is my point, but the troughs can be quite vicious. So, and the mother of all ones was in, eight, was in uh, 29, and obviously the market lost 81%, okay, before it turned back up. And then I think it took another 30 years to recover from that. So, you know, that's the that's the that's a good testament for does buy and hold work? No, I mean if you got uh, I think the the buy and hold test over 80 years, most people don't have that kind of investment horizon. I'm actually missing a, a chart in here. Let me see if I could get this chart in real quick. Before we do that, let me just, uh, we'll do a live chart for that. So here's the thing. If it's not looking good, what do you do? Well, you want to honor your stops on any leftover longs if you have any left. Like I said, during the range, we did have a few setups here and there, but over the last few months, there really wasn't a lot to do in long side, and that's by being super selective, it became harder and harder to find stocks. So the stocks of the existing portfolio just kind of slowly and methodically or systematically, everyone look at it, stopped out. Now, we didn't exit because sometimes after months, some of those stocks actually took off. And then, as I always say, 
eventually, it's kind of like buying a pet, like George Carlin used to say, it's going to deadly. You will have to give up some of that trend when you finally do catch one. So it is what it is, okay? I've learned to become, I don't want to use the word flip it, but I've learned to become matter of fact is probably a way of putting it. And I still get pissed off and I still drop F-bombs when the market goes against me after being in a longer term trend. But I realize, eh, it is what it is, okay? Try to keep a cool head. And if you're getting stopped out of the profit, so what? You made a profit. Don't look at what you could have made. And if you look at – because when you do that, and I find myself doing that like anyone else because I still have a pulse, okay? But when you do that, I find myself – and that's one thing that I've learned by being a public figure in this industry is to become really cognizant of your feelings and really cognizant of what's going on up there and as a microcosm of what others might be feeling. And it also helps to kind of like, oh, it, you're cognizant of it. So – you're aware of what's happening as opposed to have it happen to you and have it affect your trading. Now, the, what I'm, where I'm going with this is that if you're upset because you gave up some open profits, then that negative energy might keep you from seeing the next opportunity. So if you focus on the positive and like said, oh, I made a winning trade. I got a winning trade. I made some money. I didn't make as much as I could have. So what? You never will. Just don't even think about that. As long as you could have that mindset, then you have the proper mindset to move on to the next trade. As I said, I think of Dave Landry on swing trading. My first book, I said, written in 2000, late 99, 2000. I said, uh, I, you know, I was, market was doing really well. And I talked to a friend of mine who's in the industry and he was, I was like, oh, man, you, you, you're buying this, you're buying that. He's like, no. I'm, I was like, well, why not? He's like, well, I'm nursing some positions. Like, what the hell does that mean, nursing positions? They're either working or they're not, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that they might go sideways for a little while, but if the market's going straight up and you've got stops in place, they probably shouldn't go sideways or they'll probably stop out. There's something wrong with those stocks. So on your stops and any leftover longs, don't nurse any positions along. And then on the long side, because right now fighting the tape means going long because recently we've kind of rolled over in here, or it looks like we're rolling over. So as usual, you want to be super selective. And and that's that's the holy grail to trading, if there is a holy grail, is the stock selection. If you learn how to pick the best stocks, then you're going to have more winners and your mindset is going to be better and your buddy management is going to be better. And as you get more winners, you'll have more confidence. And when you come, come up on a losing trade, you will say, you know what? So what if I get stopped out because I have these other winners and your stock picking is good enough to where you know that, you know what? I'll go find some more winners. That's just what I'll do. And the story I tell so many times in this webinar is, is like what Douglas once said, uh, Mark Douglas, a uh, trading psychologist. And he said that a, a, a trader, a good trader, bad trader is kind of like a good salesman, bad salesman. A good salesman makes four or five calls and gets rejected. And he says, okay, well, let me go get a cup of coffee. Let me, um, you know, take a little walk outside, get some fresh air, get a cup of coffee, come back in. And then he makes the next 10 or 20 sales calls because he knows that he's kind of got like some bad calls. He's got some bad calls out of the way and he's due for some some good calls. A bad salesman makes those five bad calls in a row, okay, or has five bad calls in a row. It goes out and drinks his lunch. So it's the same thing in trading. Provided, of course, your stock selection is good and your stop placement is correct. Someone just recently emailed me and said, what do you do if you hit a cold streak and you hit five losing trades in a row? Well, I've had people email me and say they had 20 losing trades in a row, okay? Well, five losing trades is quite possible, but you really need to look at what you're doing if you have five losing trades in a row. I mean, I've had them. It happens, okay? Sometimes you can't hit the side of the barn. It's not always you. Sometimes it's just the markets, okay? It happens, spelled with an S-H, okay? Silent S-H. 
But provided your stock selection is good and your stops are outside of the normal volatility, like I've said before, these people that have been stopped out 20 times, a couple times in my uh, public career, I've gotten phone calls from people. Dave, I got stopped out 20 times in a row. It's like, well, either your stock selection sucks or your stops are way, way too tight. And in quite a few instances, I've fixed a lot of people with a five-minute phone call. Just said, loosen your stops. You're trading a stock that bounces around eight points a day. You try to use a two-point stop. You're almost guaranteed you're going to get stopped down. So be super selective, and, and that's very, very, very important. Seek out inefficiencies, okay? An inefficient stock is a stock where everything isn't all priced in. An inefficient stock is a stock that can make a large move, often contra to the overall market, okay? I'm not seeing many right now. I'm not seeing maybe any right now, now that I am think about it, IPOs. But there's always a possibility, and that's why I keep doing my IPO research. Seems like that if you look at my website, I still got a video, IPOs on fire. Well, they've, they've kind of cooled off a little bit in more recent times. But I'm still doing my research because let's say some new company comes along and there's some excitement about it and – doesn't it, the overall market's not doing so good, but maybe people like, well, I'm not going to run out and buy the spiders at this juncture, but this company looks kind of interesting to me, and it's also going up. So maybe an IPO. So keep an eye on an IPOs. Uh, the other thing is seek other stocks that can trade contrary to the overall market, such as commodity related stocks. Now, you don't want to rush out and buy commodity related stocks just because the market's going down, because they can go down too. In fact, metals and mining and gold. Metals and mining, gold, silver, if you want to look at them. Uh, I say metals and mining, gold, silver, because metals and mining could, is kind of a broad base uh, area, which includes gold and silver. But sometimes gold and silver could have that flight to safety. And they, they're in a longer-term downtrend. The energies are in a longer-term downtrend. So you don't just want to rush out and buy them. But it seems like lately oil is beginning to turn the corner a little bit and selected oil stocks especially and we're long uso right now and then selected oil stocks are beginning to turn the corner and maybe some of these gold and other uh industrial battles and mining are beginning to turn the corner a little bit and might be worth a shot so you don't want to buy them just because they can trade contra to the market to the market. You want to buy them when they start trading contra to the market. Let me repeat that. I think that's profound. You don't want to buy areas because they can trade contra to the market. You want to buy those areas when they're trading contra to the market. Okay. So gold and silver and the rest of the metals and mining could offer some opportunities in here soon, along with the energies. And what's kind of interesting is um, through a little osmosis and here and there, I'm getting um, some some reports from people about how these oil companies are having these massive, massive, massive layoffs. And I think that I think that an oil company could probably be the most successful oil company in the world if they if they stockpiled a bunch of cash and then when the market is like it is right now, if they would just start like you know hiring all those employees that everybody else is getting rid of, you know, and start kind of building building their war chest up and start drilling like crazy, it, it, you know, when it's at its absolute worst. But they're like horribly out of phase. And I guess it's easier said than done, but they're horribly out of phase because when, when oil is like, quote, unquote, going to $200, they're just like going crazy, crazy, crazy. And that's the absolute worst time. You know, it's near a good top when they're just like, they can't, they can't hire enough people and it's just going nuts. And it's like they, if they could figure out a way to do just the opposite, they would be the most successful oil company in the world. And I guess you have to have a lot of a lot of cash in your war chest to do that. Now, keep in mind, I mean, obviously, that could fail miserably if the commodity keeps dropping. But a commodity has – one thing about a commodity is it does have end use. And I learned that from Mike Moody, uh, who was with Dorsey and Wright for many, many years, 20 years or so. And I think he's out on his own now. And he does a lot of relative strength type of analysis. And one, one of his speeches at, at an APTA meeting was about uh, if things have end use, then they can be bought at a value or it's perceived at a value zone. Not that I'm a value player, 
but I think energies are a bit of a value in here because they've been beaten up so much and now they're beginning to turn. Okay, stocks do not have in use. Something that has in use, you know, kind of like a joke of in use would be like toilet paper. If if you could buy a high quality toilet paper, I don't know what toilet paper costs. I don't I don't uh, I don't do the shopping for that. I'll, I'll go out and get the uh, beer. I'm kind of like a beer and meat kind of guy. You know, I go up, I'll go to market supermarket, beer and steaks, and if the wife wants uh, some wine, I'll get some wine, and that's about it. Kind of a surgical strike. So I don't buy these things. I don't know, but if Let's say high. I know it costs more than ten cents a roll. If you had like super high quality toilet paper at ten cents a roll, you could buy thousands and thousands of cases of it. At some point, it would be worth something. Okay, so something like the commodity related areas, especially the well, the commodities themselves do have in use and do have value. So, and no matter what you do, you want to wait for entries and of course on your stops once trigger. Waiting for entries is very very important. We've been trying to get short three or four shorts in here for quite a while and they just haven't triggered yet and the market's kind of going straight back up so no capital is put into harm's way and that's where you can't be a hero and say oh it looks like it's going down let me just jump in you want to have the signal set up signal set up and then the trigger or the entry that third part is very important on the short side again be super selective okay just because the market's kind of gone down now doesn't mean that you should rush out and willy-nilly short anything by the way the overall market though does look like it could be in trouble so maybe that's one way if you want to gain a little exposure to the short side the only problem with shorting the indices is they're they're efficient and choppy and they're a lot harder to trade and make any significant amount of money on than individual stocks which could make much more inefficient type of moves you want to find stocks that or I'll get to that Bruce you want to find stocks that are at high levels versus, versus those that are sold out longer term if you're shorting so right now the overall market's doing this by the way as a general statement and this is probably an easy way of, of putting things as a general statement you want to kind of match the pattern to the market so right now you have a market that's rolling over from high levels looks like this so ideally you want to find stocks that are rolling over to short versus stocks that are in longer term downtrends like the energies and the golds, et cetera, is that are kind of like down here like this. Now, oh, but Dave, I thought you were a trend falling moron. Is it that still in a trend? Yeah, it's still in a trend, and it still could go lower, but the chances of it, so what's going to go back to its old lows and meander, maybe a little bit lower, as opposed to something at high levels that's got a long ways to drop, okay? The chances with this market are being oversold are a lot better than this market because a lot of selling has happened over a long period of time and it comes back to the question how do you know that everyone hasn't already sold and the answer is you don't but if a market's been in a long extended trend for a long long time then the chances are pretty good that it's pretty sold out there's not that many people left to come in i'm not saying russian and bottom fish because it could always go lower as i preached before it's always darkest right before it gets more dark that's why you don't want to try to catch a falling knife in the markets but at this particular juncture, if you're looking to short, it may be a little late in the game for those ones that are in a longer, long-term downtrend, much longer-term downtrends, as opposed to those that are just beginning to roll over. Bruce says, you have a favorite book on understanding chart patterns. I would, I would start with the, with the old, old book. I would start with books that are at least 100 years old or 50 years old at least, and then work your way forward. So I'm looking at my bookshelf now. And I, I would read uh, Schaubacher's book, and I'm trying to find it here. It's a, like Technical Analysis of Stock Charts or something like that by Schaubacher. He's got a couple out there. I have one of his rare books here, and if uh, anyone gives me eh, $2,500, I'll give it to you. Give. Huh, that's funny. Uh, it does have a dust jacket. So, uh, But you can get that one. Um, I haven't read it yet, but uh, I'm trying to think of the, that's a stock market theory of practice. Um, that would, you can get a, a newer a reprint of that for about 80 bucks on Amazon. I haven't read it, so I don't know if it's going to be good or not, but the opening few pages look pretty good. But I would read the, the, the other Schaubacher book, technical analysis book. Of course, you have to read Edwards and McGee. And all of these are listed on my website somewhere in the books, or at least it used to be. I need to get that list back up. If not, y'all let me know if it didn't. Uh, but yeah, technical analysis, stock trends by Edwards and McGee in the Schaubacher book. 
Um, and then, not not the theory and practice, but does anybody know the Schaubacher book? I forget the name of it. I'm trying to find it. But anyway, that read the you'll 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 figure out what it is, or email me as soon as I, I get off the webinar. I'll I'll go to my bookshelf. Um, here it is. Uh, let's see if I can reach without pulling out my mic. Oh oh oh. <coughs> Technical Analysis and Stock Market Profits. It's called The Real Bible of Technical Analysis by Schaubacher. So you want to read that. Um, when you're learning technical analysis, basic, classic technical analysis, take it with a big, I don't want to say take it with a big grain of salt. Maybe that's not the best way of putting it. Learn the patterns, but then learn setups within the patterns. So... For instance, learn about overhead supply and what it means and everything else, okay? But then also learn, let's get back to like a good overhead supply chart. Like right here would be a good one, okay? So learn about this, but then also learn some triggers, learn some signals, learn some setups, okay? Such as the bow tie or whatever your other favorite. It, it doesn't have to be mine. Um, the other books you should read read more modern classics obviously murphy's done extensive uh publishing and research on technical analysis as has um pring has done a um, pretty good book on uh, technical analysis so those are more modern classics but read the old ones first before you read the more uh newer ones also read um, murphy's book about uh, intermarket te technical analysis but do not try to rush out and use that because of the long lead and lag cycles but it is good to kind of wrap your head around the intermarket technical analysis for when it actually works. I don't want to digress uh, too far into that. Pring's book is Technical Analysis Explained. I've read it many years ago. I don't even remember what's in there, but I know it's one of the more modern classics on technical analysis. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not really familiar with Bilowski. I know he tried to quantify a lot of these patterns, uh, classical technical analysis patterns, and I think that's incredibly difficult to do. Um, I mean, even if you actually have a setup like the like the, the death cross, you know, uh, there's a lot more important things that happen between the signals that you have to pay attention to, like the 55% drop after the signal back in 2008. Now, it did it did come back it was only down for it was still 40 percent or whatever by the time it uh it crossed back over so it was still a significant signal but as a general statement uh you know it's kind of like a lot happen a lot could happen between now and then between the signals and all so just pay attention learn the patterns but incorporate them within the structure of something else so if i've got a bow tie underneath a mountain of overhead supply which is from technical analysis 101 that I know I have to worry about that boat time, okay? Yeah, hopefully I didn't digress too too much in that. Can you look at CEF, 50% gold stocks, 50% silver are physically held in Canada? I know all about CEF. Uh, it's uh, one of the board of directors of the founders is uh, Ian McAfee. I always have a hard time saying his name. And um, he's, a, he's a cool guy. He really is. And he, he gives, like, really good presentations. I don't know where he gets his his uh, political cartoons and graphics and pictures, but uh, funny, funny stuff. So if you ever get a chance, he's retired now, but if you ever get a chance to see him speak, uh, kind of a macroeconomic stuff, and, uh, but really cool. But uh, anyway, he's part of that goal fund. So I asked him, I said, uh, after he was through speaking, I said, I raised my hand doing the Q&A and said, uh, if you blindfolded me, spun me around three times, rode me around for a few hours, would you, could you take me to one of the vaults if I came up to Canada to visit you? And he said, not in a million years. They are super secretive about that. It's pretty amazing the way they do those things. Um, they uh, Every bar is coded, and there's, there's all kinds of uh, ways of, uh, uh, of tracking it. They have mount, mountains and mountains of, of pallets. One time a pallet collapsed. And they had to get like uh, auditors and auditors among auditors, and they went in and had to physically touch and restack 
and repalletize or whatever you call it, each bar of gold and account for everything. It's a very serious, serious business that they're into. Uh, he says when they move it, it's like the James Bond thing. There's like three trucks. You know, one truck goes off one way, two trucks go off the other way or whatever. All kinds of crazy stuff. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that real quick, and then we'll hop into the charts. In fact, you guys want to start asking questions about individual charts, uh, you can do so now. Um, it's kind of bottoming out in here, but it's taking its own sweet time. It looks like it's going to be more of a process than an event. But the CEF, which is over in Canada, eh? Uh, it does have some overhead supply to it. And that's a ways away, but for, it's 20% away. For a gold ETF, that's 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 significant. You still have to worry about it, but it, it can have a decent rally up to that. Uh, let's take a look at the bow ties real quick, and then we'll hop into the overall. Uh, we'll get back to the overall market. Um, not really bow tie just yet, but still kind of bottoming out in here. So I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. I would be more excited about some individual issues. There's one or two stocks we're, we're tracking, well, one in particular that we're looking to get long, and hopefully I'll be talking about that in um, a few weeks. Let's talk about – I want to show you the um, – I want to take a look at the weekly bow ties, and I know sometimes you guys, you guys have been around for a while. Your eyes will glaze over. But if we go to the S&P 500 – and this was supposed to be in my slides. It, I guess it didn't get saved. But we had a weekly bow tie back in 2000. We had one in 2008. I should say significant. We did have like one somewhere in 2011, but it wasn't from all-time highs or like five-year highs or something. It was just it was multi-year highs, but it wasn't like a big deal. So the ones that occur within the major signals like all time highs or major lows here, like 10 year lows. So if you get one in between, it's a minor signal. Not that you should completely ignore it, but it's not as significant as a major signal. This one here is off of all time highs. Last two times it happened off of all two time highs, 2008 and 2000, 2000, okay? So it pays to pay attention is the point I'm trying to make. Believe it or not, I do have one. When do you see these bow ties coming off of major, major highs, okay? All right, Jim says, if we wait for a trend, don't we miss the in between between the signals trade? So if the SPY goes over 200, why not treat it as a resumption of a trend out of a pullback? It would also be a breakout 20 to EMA, target 205 overhead. Okay. Um, well... No, I mean, for me, here, the way I trade and the way I see it, for me to buy the S&P 500, it would actually have to break out of the top of this range and then pull back, be like first pullback after base breakout, which I talk about quite often as, as a very viable pattern. It's a good pattern. Now, it doesn't mean that I wouldn't get excited about a bow tie up if the market was way down here, making, let's say, 20-year lows. That's a different story when you're trading a transition like this. But so what if you miss a little bit of this in-between? This is this is not much compared to, compared to that, okay, or compared to that, okay? So so what if you got to wait for it to get back to new highs? It's trend followers – you got to wait for a trend to follow, okay, or trade a very significant emerging trend. Now, I wouldn't call it an emerging trend when if or when or hopefully when, but if this market turns back up and starts going back up, I wouldn't call it an emerging trend, okay. I would just look at it as maybe longer-term trend resumption, and based on the fact that we pull back to the prior pullback and all this damage has been done, I think the market has to reprove itself by going on to make new highs, okay? All right, uh, I've kind of beat the market to death. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ real quick, and then we'll take a look at the Russell 2000. So far, we're just kind of in a deep retrace on the NASDAQ. <sighs> Bear markets are tough. I don't know if we're in one yet, but it's not looking good. But you do have these sharp retraces, so you never know if it's just going to be a sharp retrace back up and then go on the new highs, and everybody says, oh, it was a correction. 
See, I told you to just hang on, kind of like this one back here, right? But this is starting to look a little bit more serious to me, even though we still had the sharp retrace. But hey, the market can do whatever it wants, but I'm not going to get excited about the market. It's like I don't want to buy in here just so I can get knocked out as soon as it gets uh, to here and people dump that position on me. That's not worth it for a trade. I'd much rather wait for it to get to new highs. Now, if I see a stock that looks phenomenal, then I'll take it, okay? But it's going to really have to be, you know, what was the, the line in um, Pulp Fiction? It's going to have to be really one charming pick, you know? So does that answer your question, Jim? But, yeah, feel free to trade any kind of way you want. I'm just kind of telling you my take on the market. Do you use 10, 20, 30 moving on all time? Okay, do you use 10, 20, 30 moving averages on all time, uh, time frames? The answer is yes. Um, you know, it's like I preach against day trading, but kind of guilty as charged. Every now and then I'll, 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 I'll keep the Forex screens open and I have them shut down while I'm doing this presentation. But I usually I keep them open uh, on, on a couple of monitors. I mean, I have all the monitors. Might as well use them and might as well watch everything. I occasionally will fire off. A, a a trade off a five minute chart if it's just if it's just I can't stand it okay if it's like a it's like a bow tie coming off of like a major major like a five minute bow tie coming off a market that's making a major major low so I've got the longer term time frame working behind me and all that so but that's not the bread and butter that's kind of the S and G type of trade so I know people that trade a lot of uh, like five minute bow ties and stuff in S and P futures or at least used to and things like that. Uh, that's not my cup of tea. It's not something I want to rush out and do, but to each its own. If you do want to day trade, then you could do that. But uh, I, as a general statement, I preach against day trading. And keep in mind that if I do put on a day trade in something like Forex or whatever, I'm not in and out all day. I, I want to if I, I want to make no more than one trade in one instrument a day if I'm going to do that, okay? And I resist the temptation to do it anyway. But if I'm going to do it, I make one trade usually one trade and I want to hold on. Sometimes that five minute trade can be held on for days. Okay. That day trade. So it doesn't mean I don't want to go in and out all day long and make myself nuts. I think that's the worst thing in the world that you could ever do uh, from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint, to sit there and stare at a screen all day long. Okay. All right. You're welcome, Jim. All right, uh, sector action. No need to get into the sectors uh, too much because they all kind of look like the overall market. As you can see, they've all rolled over. They've all bow tied down. They've all had sharp sell-offs and pullbacks. So we're in a case now where it's kind of like they're, you know, the, the old adage, there's always a bull market somewhere. Well, not yet, at least, because most of these sectors, as you can see, they all look like they're pretty much um, – in trouble okay all right you're welcome so anything any any other questions of the overall market before we uh get into all the uh, stocks uh phil's pointing out that the cef is uh selling at a discount to the underlying value that's kind of interesting yeah um an asset in someone else's hands is always worth less than an outright asset is that how do you put that uh i guess like gold futures or or kind of or spot gold let's just say spot gold that's a that's a that's an asset that's not in someone's hands because you could you could just you could buy it but if somebody's got like a gold fund in there we're gonna take care of the gold nothing nothing bad's gonna happen to it we, we're gonna you know put it in two to three different trucks move it around we're not gonna let anybody steal the gold so that's so that's why that gold is at a discount. I haven't ever done the research, but that's something that that's the kind of thing that Ian might do, McCarthy, um, where you look at the net asset value to the actual value and figure out when you should be buying these things and when you should be selling them. Uh, some things could actually trade at a premium. Any of you guys remember many, many years ago? when um, the nightly business report was always talking about like the Germany fund, when they first came out with the Germany fund and everybody's all excited, there was a huge premium in there, meaning that the fund was cost more than what it was actually worth. So yeah, it's something to do. 
Amen for a short would be 40, and an entry point would be 39. 40 and 39, it seems kind of tight for Steve. Uh, 40 and 39? Oh, would an entry point, I thought you'd be like 40 and 39 for stop. Uh, I tend to be a little bit more liberal lately. So I would pick those two. I'd go with 39. In fact, I might even go a little bit lower, maybe below this little point here. This is not a bad-looking stock. The problem that we're up against now is that the market's pulled back so many days that, as a general statement, with, with the shorts, let me see if I can find. Let me do a blank chart for you real quick. With the short pattern emerging trend pattern let's use the first thrust because that's kind of like an easier one to talk about let's say the market is a sharp sell-off looks something like that and by market i mean stock okay now if we have a first thrust it makes this higher high and higher low I, in an ideal world you want to see that trigger like the next day and do this and the reason is because people don't have time to react and they get caught on the wrong side of the market but if this thing starts trading day after day after day and kind of pulling back, and this is especially true on the short side, it's just not as exciting to me because the, the, there's a lot of jockeying for positions that happens and people get in and out or whatever. If this move happens like right after one or two bars of pullback, then you know that a lot of people are in a lot of trouble. But when it starts consolidating, it gets tougher and tougher and tougher. S&P 500, the uh, NASDAQ, the Dow, whatever, uh, they're all getting – it's a little tougher now because they're, they're, they're pulling back so many days and they're big up days and big down days. And so it's kind of – some of these people are washing out of the system. Some of these people, uh, like let's say some of these funds are like selling like uh, with both fists on these rallies. So they're, they're getting out of the market. So you no longer have them to push you lower. And again, it all comes back to the psychology of what happens. Think about what happens on the short side. And that's on the long side, too, even. And that's why on the long side, in a transitional pattern, transitional meaning coming down and bottoming out, beginning to rally, I like to see this. Let's just put some bars in here. I like to see them just kind of pull back one or two days and then take off. Because if it, when it does this, the people that didn't get around to buying on the bottom – we're now going to be forced in yeah, the shorts that were feeling like, oh, it's starting to go back down again. I'm not going to worry about it. They're going to get squeezed out. So the most amount of people are trapped on the wrong side of the market. And then when that trigger happens, it's going to really make a big difference. OK, so that's the problem. And I'm glad you brought that one up, uh, Steve, because I think that's the problem that we're up against in the market is now they're pulling back so many days. In fact, we've got three shorts we're looking at for today. And like I told my peeps last night, we'll probably start taking them off the radar. And then it's going to be a little harder for me to find setups because now you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So it usually I rarely go more than 10, 11, 12 days at a pullback. So, yeah, I think the stock's still in trouble. Uh, I think your entry should be way down here somewhere. In fact, let's take a little crosshair on that. Maybe around... Yeah, I think 39, even 39 would be too tight. I'd put a little lower, maybe below this little pivot, 38 and change or something. But again, a lot of days in the pullback on that one, okay? Oh, by the way, I went to a uh, Greek and Lebanese restaurant, and uh, I asked the uh, manager, I pointed to the GY. R O is that how you spell it? I pointed to that and I asked him to pronounce it, and he said gyro, like a gear in an O. And then just for validation, I said okay. And and where are you from? And he says I'm from Mexico. So I guess the jury is still out because I couldn't find uh, someone from Greece there to ask. But I do have a friend in Greece. My editor from Traders Magazine uh, lives in Greece. And uh, I keep forgetting to Skype him. So I'm going to Skype him between now and next week. And we will solve this uh, gyro, gyro, gyro uh, situation. Uh, DPLO, a short or need more pullback? DPLO. Uh, 
Well, you kind of had a first thrust here, and then now you've got this kind of consolidation here. I think it's in a lot of trouble, but I think I would um, – I think I'd maybe find something else at this juncture. So, yeah, at this, at this juncture, it's too shallow. Now, I do like shallow pullbacks. If you're short, stay short, because on this day here, that would have been a short because it had that one big up day, that one day pullback, but now it's just kind of meandering around. So if you got short on that one big up day in the first thrust, then, yeah, stay short. I'm more excited about um, less efficient stocks on the short side right now because they they tend to be more priced for perfection as opposed to a biotech or something like that because biotech, they can come out with a cure for something or whatever, and they can have a huge pop, whereas some of these more established and, and especially like single dimension, single dimensional, single dimensional companies when they begin to crack because they're they're more priced for perfection they could roll over a lot faster do you find beta contra do you use beta to find contra market stocks i use historical volatility which is h which i call hv which i have on all my charts right there i don't know if you can see it to give me a feeling for what the beta is of a stock beta is um, how a stock trades relative to the overall market uh, on the short side, you, you tend to you could tend to go with a little bit lower beta stock, and you're looking for that you're looking for that expansion of volatility versus shorting a vo more volatile stock to begin with. On the long side, ideally you want a little bit higher beta or a little bit higher volatility, so but not too high because if it's too high, it, you've already had the expansion of volatility. If you get the trade exactly right. Then you get two things. You get an expansion to, expansion of volatility and an expansion in price. And if you can stand it, go in and watch as many YouTubes as you can stand, and you'll see that in many presentations I talked about that. Trading done right, trend trading done right, you're catching an acceleration of trend. You're making as much money. You're making money fast. You're making money over the shorter period. Uh, making money fast, and you're capturing trend. When both those things happen, and especially if you get that big expansion in range, in the direction of the trend, then the volatility is going to increase significantly. So you're not only trying to catch a trend, you're trying to catch an expansion of volatility. People, I think, don't really understand that that's all part of the equation. And that's why you have uh, – that's why it's important to trade the stocks that are that are volatile enough to trade, volatile enough to move, but haven't already made such a volatile move that – they're just kind of like all over the place and it's too late to trade them. HV, good. We'll watch more videos. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome, Jim. Fizz for art. Fizz? I'm going to put my glasses on. Is it F-I-Z-Z? Not coming up. Oh, there it is. Yeah, now you don't want to rush out and buy food stocks. Because, in fact, let's take a look at them real quick. Food stocks right here. Because even the food stocks have rolled over. Now, you got to be careful what you learn or read about markets. Because in some cases, they might say, well, if the market begins to roll over, you want to buy defensive stocks. Well, not necessarily. You buy defensive stocks if they're going up. So if I had a food stock that looked good right now, I'd say, well, people still – eat in a bear market or a consumer non-durable stock that looked pretty good because people still use personal products in a bear market, okay, or, or maybe to some extent, maybe a big drug company because people take drugs in a bear market, maybe even more drugs in a bear market. So these so-called defensive issues can offer opportunities, but unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. Uh, as I wrote my column, I think it's Steve Todd said, and it was a uh, quoting from Tom McClellan's blog, is you is or is you isn't in a trend. So this doesn't look like it's in a trend to me. So it's going to have to be uh, one charming pig for me to rush out and buy a food stock. Now let's get back to your stock question. First of all, notice that this stock has very, 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 very tiny volume, okay? 
47,000 on average shares. That's way too thin to be trading. Now, as a private trader, you could do these kind of things. You could trade with thin stocks, you know, because I know you might be saying, but Dave, some of those IPOs you talk about are really thin. Yeah, I know. And as a private trader, you could trade those thin stocks. But once an issue is more established, ideally you want a little bit more volume in the trade to make them a little bit more liquid. The more liquid the stock, and obviously the efficiency comes down with liquidity, not enough time to get into all that, but just know that the more liquid a stock, the less frictional costs you're going to have, the less spreads to deal with. Uh, and the spreads cut both ways, on the way in, the way out. So it's much easier to get in and out of a more thick stock than it would be to something like this, which not trading many shares at all. I mean, what's it, 9,600 shares so far today? You know, you go in and trade 1,000 shares of this, and then you're, what, 10% of today's volume? So be careful on that. So as a general statement, I've ignored on that. But I hear you. It's breaking out. It hasn't really pulled back just yet. So it looks okay. Uh, I don't like the way it's kind of – it's just taken out this prior top. The way it's just barely above this prior top, I guess you should, I should say. Um, I'd prefer if, like, all this price movement was above this prior high here. So based on those reasons, I would pass. Peter wants to know about RIG, R-I-G. All right. Yeah, this looks fantastic. I mean, at first glance. Okay, let's pick it apart a little bit. Um, but I'm seeing a bow tie. Now, that's the kind of bow tie you want, or that's the type of transitional pattern you want. Something in a much longer term, long, long, long term downtrend. Let's take a look at like a monthly chart. or Yeah, let's, let's pop out to a monthly chart. Okay. This stock was at 130 bucks a share a few years ago. More than a few years ago, I guess what, five and three, eight years ago, and now it's at uh, fourteen bucks a share. Now, but Dave, you said don't buy something just because you think it's low. Well, I'm not saying buy it because it's low, but I'm saying that keep an eye on it because it looks like you could get a bow tie in here. I'd like a little bit more significant thrust from low, but it's made an okay move. So, uh, I'm I, I'm not saying. <laughs> That it's not set up just yet, but I would definitely keep an eye on it for uh, a setup. What do you think about Beat? That can be a fun one. Uh, beat looks good. And you got okay volume. And, you know, here's a stock that's defying gravity. It's, it's headed higher. So, yeah, on a pullback, this one should be in my momentum list. If not, shame on me. Andrew, 100. I need to clean out. Let's see. Beat. Nope. Yeah, there it is right there. So, and that's the beauty of uh, tracking a momentum list like I do, just because it, it, it helps to let you know what's going on. But, yeah, on a pullback, maybe. It's going to have to be a really beautiful setup. But you've got persistency here, and you've got some acceleration higher. So you've got the makings for a good trend and a good pullback. So good eye on that. High five, okay? Even though it's not set up yet, high five. First high five of the day. Don wants to know about C-E-N-X. Mm, not yet. And it also looks like it's got a lot of overhead supply. Well, not too bad on the overhead supply. Yeah, it's got, of course, I guess it'd be a good problem to have. Uh, not yet. For me, I think it'd have to get maybe up to uh, nine or so because of the the bad memories or overhead supply in this one. But we'll know when we see it. A little too early to play a transition in that one. But I, I hear where you're coming from. YK? I can't read that. YK? YK. CLF? Yeah, that's one I've been watching. does have the overhead supply. I liked it back here. Notice I've got it all drawn in. And, you know, in hindsight, it had a pretty decent move. And in hindsight, I guess that's enough move to make a trade worthwhile. But I like to get it at trades that have potential to make a lot of, lot, a lot of, a lot of money. Okay. So, but you can see that so far it's headed higher and looking pretty good coming out of this little, uh, this little cup and handle, this little first thrust, et cetera. But it's got too much overhead supply right now, Now that, especially now that we're up towards it. So I would pass just based on that. You're welcome, Bob. 
Isaac wants to know about shoe stocks. Isaac, uh, next time uh, you ask about a stock, just ask about a stock and hit return. But I'll, I'll go ahead and, and answer them both right now. Uh, this one's actually momentumless. My momentumless too. I'm not a big fan of the stock because it doesn't usually trade cleanly. It tends to tends to gap all over the place. Uh, I guess earnings or something pushes it around, or gun control laws are threatening thereof, whatever. Or every time somebody shoots somebody. Uh, but your your big trend here is just this one big gap up so far. So this would have to continue higher, which so far so good, admittedly. Is if it can continue higher and higher, maybe on a pullback. So yeah, this should definitely be on your momentum list, and I think it's on one of my momentum lists. And then J Blue, J B L U. JB, these are mean to say. JBLU. Um, yeah, this is another one that caught my eye on a momentum basis. Let me just see if we get this. This still works. Um, you can see, yeah, look, it's been, uh, it should be on some of these lists. But yeah, it's definitely, uh, defying gravity. Um, Kind of erratic behavior though it had this huge sell-off and now it's all the way back up here so for me to get excited about it i mean not from a standalone momentum basis yeah it's going higher so if you're tracking a bunch of momentum stocks then yeah put it on your momentum list but i wouldn't rush out and trade it unless it could show some pretty serious follow through to the upside and maybe pullbacks along the way okay yeah uh, james bt is one you've been seeing on my landry list um, so usually those are off limits, but I hear you. Uh, the reason I haven't recommended it as a, an official setup is look at the HV. It's 174. So it's a little bit too crazy, even for a crazy Dave standards. Okay. So that's why you haven't seen it, but it does look like it's bottomed out. But now it's like too many days in the pullback based on the bottoming pattern. And, and especially when you consider the volatility of the stock. So I would pass, but it's not necessarily a pass forever. If this thing comes down and, and, the, and the volatility dries up like it did here, and you see maybe that second mouse signal, that second, uh, let's say, another bow tie after a serious bottom, then it might be worthwhile. So definitely keep it on your watch list, but certainly not set up now and certainly too dangerous. Steve wants to know about VRA. Too much gap, too little pullback. Um, well, you've got a tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of overhead supply. So, but eh, no, it's too far away to, to get excited. Uh, is it too much gap? Um, it's not bad. It's, it's, you know, if I'm just seeing, yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit too much gap, but as a general statement, it looks pretty damn good, uh, because it's coming off of an all time lows here. Uh, I wouldn't get too excited about this bow tie because this is what I call a forced bow tie. When price makes a big, huge jump like that, the bow tie uh, happens. Uh, it's kind of forced to happen. So it's not like it bottomed out and bow tied or whatever. Uh, I think it looks pretty good, but I would pass based on this unbelievable mountain of overhead um, um, resistance. Aaron says, Dave, Aaron's over there, my near, next, uh, he's my next door neighbor over there in Mississippi. Uh, what do you do to find possible new trends forming that may not show up in your scan list? Okay. Quite simple. Look at two, 3,000 stocks every day. And you're going to see, uh, <laughs> Aaron says, my coon ass neighbor. <laughs> um, uh, that's a badge I wear proudly. I'm about, uh, I think I'm over half Cajun. Got a little German in me, um, but I'm mostly Cajun. Uh, <laughs> so what do I do to find ones? Yeah, it's because I did that sea metals and mining pop up much, but it looks like a new trend for me. You just have to look at everything. And then at the least, make sure you're looking at, you know, there's, it, it doesn't take but five minutes, but um, make sure you're looking at those major big groups like we just looked at. And just look at all of them if you have time. And, it, and again, it only takes five minutes. I mean, here are the major mid groups. So let's just go through the major MIGs real quick. 
And you could see most are headed lower, most have rolled over, blah, 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 like I've been preaching about for the last hour and a half. But when you get to the energies, again, still looks like a serious downtrend, but look at where they look at where they are and where they were. Okay, they've they've well it looks like a half, not quite a half. And then when you get to metals and mining, you can see that they're way down here. And let's take a look at the quarterly chart, a monthly chart. And you can see that on a monthly basis, they were about three times higher than what they were. They would have to rally about 400% just to get back to break even in here. So it's like they're pretty sold out longer term. And then on a shorter term basis, notice that it's the net net thing beginning to rear its ugly head. Where are they now? Well, they're just below 400. Where were they a couple of months ago, just below 400? So if anything, the trend is beginning to go sideways. Yeah, the big blue arrow is still pointing down. But as a general statement, the trend started to go sideways. Now, if you're looking at two or 3,000 stocks a day anyway, you're going to see some of these stocks that are bottoming out. And keep in mind that my scans are very loose. So I, run, I look through most of those two or 3,000 stocks in my tradable universe. And then I run my scans too. And my scans are just looking for a recent 20-day high or low. So some of these stocks down at these lows in metals and mining, and let's just jump over to that sub-industry. I'm sorry, I jumped to industry. Change watch list to industry components. And let's sort them by volume, like five-day volume. So when you come down here, notice that Freeport Mac Moron came up in, in my – scans recently and this was on the landry list not too long ago and the question is well why is it in scans it doesn't look like much of a pullback well i'm only looking for a 20-day high and right here you had a 20-day high and then you had a little pullback from that okay so you had that first thrust type of setup not quite a bow tie just yet but a first thrust right so that's how i found that stock by Either A, running this loose scan that looks for that 20-day high, and even if this isn't a 20-day high, by looking at a lot of stocks, I'm going to see it anyway. So my scans are kind of like things that I might have missed, and then my actual looking at a lot of stocks or like seeing that things are developing, like Alcoa. You can see in here, recently made a 20-day high. Today, you got a little pullback. So that's going to come up tonight in my scans if I don't just see it by flipping through the charts. What is your universe loose scan looking for? Two things. Trading universe is um, volume, 250K or more, and I make that every night. And my scans are ran on the entire database, and I forget exactly what the volume is, but it's probably around 200K or so, just so I'm looking at a little bit more liquid issue, especially if I'm going to – put it in the trading service where I know that uh, not that there's that many people in the service, but there's a few people. And I also want everyone to be able to be, I don't want to be the guy that goes out there and shows you some little thin penny stock and it goes up hundred percent. So you see it went up hundred percent when you in reality could not have actually traded that stock. I want to put out stocks that could actually be traded. Okay. And it's the same stocks that I'm actually looking at too. So hopefully that answers your question. You're welcome, Aaron. Amber? Uh, nope. You want to short it or you want to buy it? No, it's in a pretty serious downtrend. You certainly don't want to buy that. Okay, that's pretty obvious. And it might actually be too short to too so, – uh, somewhat too late to short. Now, if the market gets an established downtrend – then, like I said earlier, match the pattern to the market. Start shorting those stocks that are all also in established downtrends. Match the pattern to the market. But right now, you want to go out and find stocks before they crack as opposed to uh, afterwards short. Yeah, maybe in the next pullback. But, again, try to find something at higher levels first. AMCX for Tom.
Well, you kind of got the second pullback back into the first pullback. So, yeah, it still looks like it's in trouble. And you guys are probably thinking the day David hates everything. He's like Mikey. He hates everything. But that's just because the market's rolled over. Um, but hate everything, meaning everything looks like they're still in trouble. But I would find try to find something that looks like this as opposed to this double pullback thing like we talked about earlier when we were talking in the slides. Andre wants to know about BLDR as a long, BLDR long. It better be one charming pig. Uh, well, you've got this first, this huge big gap way back here, which is most of that trend. So um, it would have to really continue higher nicely for me to get too excited about this one. But I certainly hear you. I mean, it's, it's definitely a trend. Uh, I would double check to make sure they weren't bought out when you see a move uh, that big. How do you see Skechers now? I'm short Skechers and losing a little bit. I know you saw it last week. Short side's tough. I'm not going to make no bones about that. Well, you just follow your plan. Um, I think it's still in trouble. It's too. I would not short it now, but if you short, stay short. And then, um, I don't know if this line up here is what I drew, but you need to fairly, give it a fairly wide berth, and hopefully you traded fewer shares um, based on that. But, yeah, I still think the stock's in a lot of trouble, but you might be at the mercy of the overall market if we have a sharp retrace of the overall market, okay? Calvin wants to know about FTK. FTK. Uh, it's not bad. Uh, chemicals, I think, are pretty not so hot lately, but uh, it's not bad. The I don't like this big well, – I don't like the way it gapped up in here. And then had this big thrust lower. So it's kind of a little wide and loose. So I think I would pass based on that. But my initial reaction is it's not bad because it's headed higher in spite of the overall market. Maybe that's why I initially thought it looked good. But as I kind of pick it apart, I'm not as excited about it as it was. So maybe some of these metals in mining that are bottoming out, uh, just start keeping an eye there. Thoughts on the quid? Uh, be careful with these inverse things. The tracking errors can be abysmal. Uh, but yeah, sometimes if you, if you don't short or if you can't short cause you have an IRA, by the way, you can buy puts in the IRA, but then that opens up a whole nother can of worms. So let's try not to get too much into options. Um, I would just tread lightly with these, these inverse shares. And if it's, this, is this a leveraged inverse share? Uh, they could, they could really be the worst. I mean, a while back, just as a, just as an experiment, I tried to put some into my Landry 100. And it really crippled my performance. It really messed them up, messed up the performance. Uh, if the market makes a really strong move in one direction and persistent move, then, yeah, they could do really well. But they're tough to hold on to longer term, especially because it's on the short side, there's decay. And then if they're leveraged, it makes it even worse. So you got to be really careful. They're tracking the day-over-day -day change is what their goal is. And they're going to have some um, – tracking error in that but if you think about it if you're tracking day over day change that's a lot different the one day change is a lot different than like a multi-day change so even if the market does go up 10 percent or down 10 percent whatever way you want it to go if they're tracking that day over day trade change then there's a tracking error that's introduced now someone um i think it was steve place was saying dave that you're wrong they're doing exactly what the perspective says they're going to do. Prospectus says they're going to do. But in reality, though, if you are tracking the day-over-day -day change, it's going to exacerbate that what appears, that apparent tracking error, okay? So stay away from those. And then here's the thing. You could day trade them, but then even if you're day trading – if it's triple leverage, then you could only buy or sell a third of what you normally will. So be careful of that leverage too. So I would just I would avoid them at all costs as a general statement. What do you think about inside bars? Oh, I love inside bars. I like outside bars too, but only when it's cool outside or if I'm like at the beach where I could go jump in the water. Oh, you're talking about stock charts. Oh, okay. Uh, what do you think about inside bars? Have you ever tried it? Does it work? Um no, not really. Uh, I mean, unless you're trading a really short-term pattern, 
maybe let's look at the spiders or something. Um, you can get a volatility compression. But see, right now, everything's going to be an inside bar because we've had this volatility expansion. But sometimes you can get a volatility compression. And I'm trying to find some in the chart with inside bars, but I don't trade them. Uh, I'm a trend guy. I'm looking for an emerging trend or an established trend. Okay. But yeah, there's some much, much shorter term patterns. But the problem with trading short, short, short term and, and not holding on for longer term gains is that if you have a big loss, you don't make enough money on those little short term trades. I mean, there's some really fascinating things you could research like compression of volatility and inside bars and narrow range bars. And that, a lot of that Toby Crable stuff is kind of cool, the narrow range seven and all that other good stuff. But if you're not holding, if you're not catching major trends like I like to do where I'm trading for the short term gain, yeah, I'll give a little piece off. But I'm also hanging on to a piece for a longer term trend. If you're not catching that longer term trend, then you got to be really good at what you do on a short term basis because sooner or later you're going to get whacked really bad even on a short term basis. And if you have big longer term gains from stocks that you held on for six months, eight months, a year, whatever, then it helps to mitigate those occasional little wax that you get, for lack of a better word. So just be careful with that. Hush, hush, anonymous wreck ticker call within movie Mud. Cool Mississippi kid movie. Mud, I have to watch that. I, I just, I don't know. I got it on, I see it on Netflix all the time. Is it any good? Um, this looks like a major longer term bottom. Uh, it's a li it's just too wide loose though. It's all over the place. It's uh Jackie Mason stock. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. So I would pass based on that, but I hear what you're saying. It looks like a major bottom's in place there. FTK, not the second guess, but is the energy sector, but a stock that has already moved higher. Curious your view. FTK? Did we talk about that one? Uh yeah, we talked about that one. I think we just kind of beat the dead horse in that one a little bit. All right, lightning round. AVG for short for Hari. I hope I got your name right. <laughs> he emailed me a while back because I kept saying it wrong. Um, did I get it right? I have a lot of names to keep up, but I'm sorry if I didn't. Uh, it's still in trouble, but I think maybe find something at higher levels. If you're already short, then absolutely stay short. Yeah. He short at 24 something, bought it back at oh wow, nice trade. Yeah, just hang on to a piece because you might you might have a tiger by the tail here. Okay. Call. Yeah, we did that one. ACI, did we do that one? Um this one was on my list, but look at the uh this is why I didn't recommend it. 291 is the H V. I mean this thing went up like thousand percent over a few days and then it had this huge retrace. Uh, if this scaling wasn't so extreme, this is kind of like the gatekeeper, even though I'm not a big fan of it on the short or long side, I should say, prefer the short side. But I would I would pass on this one just because the volatility is so crazy. But I hear you. It definitely looks like a bottom. So you're welcome, Jim. Win for Don. Uh, this is one that I've been keeping an eye on. Um, it looks okay. It's not really set up now, but it's certainly bottoming out in here and certainly had a pretty good run up its lows, but it's not set up at this juncture. Sid for Howard, that's going to be a steel stock. Yeah, I mean, it could set up soon. I mean, um, a lot of these lower tiered, I'm starting to see like less than a dollar uh, energy stocks are beginning to set up in here. Some of these lower tiered metal stocks like this one are beginning to set up. And, you know, you've got tremendous volume, so even though they're kind of penny stocks. Uh, but, yeah, it's not quite set up yet, but absolutely. that's That looks like it's bottoming out, and that could uh, could set up soon. So keep an eye on that one. EFOI, thoughts today on the pullback for Mr. Reese. Um, this one has had a little bit too much of an extreme move, even from, by my standards. It's up over 600%, 500 600%. 
So a little too crazy now. And then look at your HV up at 141. Uh, I hear you. Maybe on a pullback. Uh, today's pullback is nothing, okay? Even though it's 9% or whatever it is, that's nothing for this stock. Uh, this stock would have to pull back really deeply, maybe as, as deep as 20 before I think it would be worth taking a shot at because you really need a lot of people knocked out of such an extreme trend. But I would pass because it's like too much of a good thing. Okay, oh, but Dave, you always want trend. Eh, but it's a little bit, 600%, that's a little too much. GGB, we could have to hurry up here. GGB. Yeah, I mean, here's another steel and iron stock. It's kind of bottoming out. It's not really set up just yet, okay? You don't have the bow tie. You don't really have a first thrust hire. But absolutely, keep this on your radar, okay? Not that you want to rush out and bottom fish a penny stock, okay? But when it does begin to turn, look at this Look at this volume on this. This is a big, thick company that just got really, 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 really beat up, okay? And you don't have overhead supply. You know, you've got, what, 100% up to overhead supply uh, before it hits its first overhead supply. So by all means, uh, this this needs to be on your radar, but it's not set up yet. So they'll come the next week's show and say, hey, Dave, I bought GGB, and it's still bottoming out. You know, what do I do? No, wait for it to set up. But, yeah, absolutely. It looks, uh, it looks interesting. Almost a high five. Good show. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Caesar. Does Caesar really live here? I didn't think so. Uh, it's too wide and loose, Don. And you got a lot of trading over here, so I'd pass based on that. Lee for Rickett. Lee. Uh, yeah, you got a bow tie gap down way over here. That's a long time ago. Um, yeah, that looks that looks interesting. I'd say yes to that one. A uh, little bit of a knockout move. Nice little move from Lowe's. Nice bow tie. Let's back it out a little bit. I'll, I'm hoping I'm not making a quick decision based. Eh, a lot of overhead supply. I think I would pass based on the overhead supply. But if all I was seeing was this right here, the right side of the chart. By the way, if you find a broker lets you trade off the left side of the chart, please let me know. But, yeah, Art, great, uh, great eye on that one. Uh, but, again, it's got some longer-term problems. But maybe for a trade. I mean, I wouldn't personally take it, but for a trade, yeah, I, I hear you. But I'd, I'd be a little concerned about the overhead supply. Plus, you got this big gap down here. You don't know how many people got caught on the wrong side of the market and how many people could be looking to get out of break even as this thing begins, begins to rally back. So I would pass based on those reasons. Well, I know we got somebody that's a question. Just shoot me an email, anything that's unanswered. I'll be happy to um, to get back with you. Uh, and if we don't talk between now and next Thursday, I hope to see you guys again next Thursday. Everyone have a fantastic weekend. Um, I love these shows. Thank you so much for, for coming. I, I have a blast, as you can probably tell by doing them. So I appreciate it. Uh, everyone, again, have a great weekend. And uh, hopefully I'll see all you guys again um, next uh, week. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome.